All right, now we are starting on a new chapter. And in that new chapter, we are focusing on finding area underneath of a curve. So in order to find area underneath a curve, there are a few things that we have to look at. You're gonna be introduced to a whole new operation uh, in this chapter and the specific way that we find area underneath of a curve and how we write area underneath of a curve. But before we get there, let's calculate some areas underneath of a curve. So here we have, let's pretend that Atticus pushes an Eden across the floor at a constant rate of three feet per second. How far will the car have traveled after four seconds? And those of you who have taken physics or heck, I imagine in algebra one, you're still taught this stuff. Uh, the old fashioned dirt formula, D equals RT, the distance equals the rate times the time. So we can actually figure out how far Atticus has pushed that Eden across the floor by just saying the distance is equal to the rate of three feet per second times the time of four seconds. So we can actually see some dimensional analysis, the seconds drop out, and we're left with three feet times four, which would give us 12 feet. Well, down here we have another interpretation of how to find out how far Atticus has pushed that Eden. What we have done here is we have drawn the, fun the velocity function versus time. So the velocity is a constant function. So you'll notice that the velocity function is a horizontal line. What we've also done here is we've blocked out the area underneath the curve, all that blue space underneath that curve. What I am here to tell you today is that the area underneath the curve represents the accumulation of a rate. So when we look at it here, the accumulation of velocity, when you are going at a velocity, you're accumulating distance that you've run. So the area underneath here is equal to the accumulation of that rate, accumulation of that velocity. And therefore, all we have to do to find the area is do the base times the height, because in this particular situation, we have a nice little uh, uh, shape called a rectangle. So the base times the height, the base here is four times the height of three. We will have four seconds times three feet per second, which yield that 12 feet in the exact same manner as the dirt formula. It's just an alternate way of looking at it. So ultimately, that's one of the uh, uh, things that we're gonna be doing with area. Now, what we should be looking at is what happens if that area is non-constant, right? So let's look over here. And I believe, yes, I do. I have a GeoGebra uh, file. Hold on one second, let me pull it up. All right, what you can see up here is I actually have a file from GeoGebra, and I'll link this in the, uh, in, in the folder so you can play around with it. Because really what this uh, allows us to do, it allows us to understand something called a Riemann sum. Another word for a Riemann sum is a rectangular approximation. And there are three types of Riemann sums that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about an LRAM, an RRAM, and an MRAM. Uh, approximate the area under a curve with the rectangular approximation method. By the way, if you're scared of LRAM, RRAM, and MRAM, uh, notice that all of them involve the word, or the letters R-A-M. Those R-A-Ms stand for rectangular approximation method. Down here, we have a rectangular approximator in order for us to find out the area under a curve. You can enter any function you want. You can change the limits x1 and x2, uh, meaning the beginning and the end of the interval. In this particular case, since we're starting at zero, and ending at four, we're trying to find the area underneath this curve of 16 minus x squared between zero and four. You can see you uh, select either, uh, dang it, I didn't want to say what R, L, and M stood for yet, but you can read them right there, and change N to adjust the number of rectangles. So just real quick, N gives us the number of rectangles. 
we can have a really bad approximation. Like in this case, we have an LRAM. An LRAM is so named because all of the rectangles that we draw uh, determine the height of each rectangle by the left endpoint. Notice that this is a RAM with one rectangle. I can compare this LRAM to an RRAM. Now, keep in mind, LRAM has the left endpoint determining the height of a rectangle. The RRAM is going to be the right endpoint. Now, look at the right endpoint of this interval. Again, we're going from 0 to 4. The right endpoint is a height of nothing. So you can actually see the RRAM would yield a value of 0. Then we can also have an MRAM, which the midpoint of the interval determines the height of the rectangle. So the midpoint between 0 and 4 would be at 2. Our rectangle there is going to be right about here. So there you can see we have three RAMs displayed simultaneously. Let's get rid of some of these. So this is really going to be able, you're really going to be able to see how this works when we start increasing n. Like, look at what happens when I have two rectangles. Those two rectangles, now all of a sudden, instead of having an LRAM of 64, I have an LRAM of, ah, come on, get to two. There we go, of 56. 56 is still bad because we still have these hanging off bits, but 56 is going to be closer than that 64 because we've eliminated this space up here from being counted as well. And I can put in my RAM, you can see a better approximation, and my MRAM right there. So just going back to having the LRAM and the RAM, I can see for a fact that my LRAM is what we call an over approximation because all of the rectangles are above the curve. The RAM is going to be an under approximation because all the rectangles are under the curve. And there's a really easy way to determine whether it's over or under approximation just by looking at some information that we can determine from previous, uh, from pre previous chapters. Now looking here, I know that the true answer is somewhere in between 56 and 24. If I want to get a better approximation, you might be able to figure out what I would have to do. The more rectangles that I have, the better my approximation is going to be. This is kind of a double-edged sword when we start getting more and more rectangles. I mean, let's go back to one rectangle. In order to find the area under this curve, I really only had to find the area of one rectangle. Like here, I had to do 16, a height of 16 times a width of 4 versus down here, a height of 0 and a width of 4. When I go to my two rectangles, all of a sudden I need to calculate the areas of two rectangles, so it's twice as much work. Four rectangles, even further, twice as much work than when we had two rectangles. If I wanted to make the best approximation possible, I would want to make even more rectangles than this computer can handle. And it looks like the most it can handle is somewhere 100 rectangles. I would have to calculate 100 areas and add them all together in order to get these calculations. And still, I have my LRAM being an over approximation. If I was able to zoom in, I could see my LRAM would be over it. And my RRAM would be an under approximation because all the rectangles would be under. Heck, let's see if I can zoom in. Let's see if my computer can handle that. Okay, it's scrolling really slowly, so I don't really want to zoom in enough for us to see that those rectangles are under and or over there, uh, but just trust me, the LRAM is the high end, the RRAM is the low end, and, and again, I will show you how to determine whether it's an under or an over approximation without having to see the rectangles. There's a very simple explanation that we have. And the MRAM being 42.667. Unfortunately, without knowing ex what the exact value is, we can't tell the accuracy for the MRAM. Now, this probably wasn't clear in all of my wordings from before, but in this section, you're actually going to have to calculate those RAMs. So you're not going to have that computer program to determine these RAMs. You're going to have to do it by hand. So I'll try to show you how to do that a little bit later. But we have some uh, velocity varying. So this draws it back to that Atticus and Eden problem here. If the velocity is not constant, 
Uh, you can guess the distance traveled is still equal to the area. Uh, no, not, not you can guess, but the area underneath the curve is still equal to the distance traveled. The units do still work out, but now you subdivide into as many rectangles as you want. In this course, I will tell you how many rectangles you're gonna be uh, using. This right here is an LRAM. Again, LRAM stands for left-hand rectangular approximation method. Uh, that's probably an important thing to put in your notes, or just sh for short, LRAM. In order to do this LRAM, you need to find the heights at all of the left endpoints of each sub-interval, and then you need to multiply by the width of each sub-interval. What you should notice here is each sub-interval in this uh, situation is going to be uh, equal length. So here, each sub-interval was one unit long, which is why when I calculate the velocity at each sub-interval, I'm just multiplying it by one to find the approximate area here being 5.75. That's my LRAM. Notice that my LRAM in this case, unlike on that uh, GeoGebra uh, 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 work, the LRAM is going to be an under approximation. Notice that I have all of my rectangles are underneath the curve. Oh gee, I wonder how I can tell that that's an under approximation. That was me being sarcastic, I will tell you later. I see my RAM is the same thing, except the heights of my rectangles are determined by my right endpoints. So here, instead of using my first uh, height as uh, the uh, uh, one and one eighth, or the, sorry, the one, I'm now gonna use one and one eighth as my first height, and then one and a half, and then two and one eighth, and then three. Again, each sub-interval width is one, so I'm just going to multiply each height by one to get each, uh, uh, each area of the rectangle add them all together to get my RAM is 7.75. Again, RAM meaning right-hand rectangular approximation method. This right-hand rectangular approximation method is going to be an over approximation because all of my rectangles hang above the curve. So again, I don't know what the exact value is, but I know it's somewhere in between 5.75 and 7.75. The MRAM, the midpoint rectangular approximate approximation requires me to go to the midpoint of each sub-interval. So my first sub-interval was from 0 to 1, midpoint between 0 and 1 is 0.5. I calculate the height at 0.5, which is right here, and by plugging it into the original function, I can find out that my height is 1.03125, multiply that by 1 to find the area of that first rectangle. Do the same thing for the second rectangle, third rectangle, and fourth rectangle. Unfortunately, I have no idea whether this is an over approximation or under approximation without actually cal without calculating the exact value, something that you guys don't know how to do yet. But again, some important things here, midpoint rectangular approximation method, MRAM, those are important things that you will see. Mm. Here we can see upping the number of sub-intervals sub to eight sub-intervals. So each endpoint is at like 0 0.5, 1, 1.5, 2.5. And you can see this is still an MRAM. So for the first sub-interval between 0 and 0.5, I use F of, or the velocity at halfway between 0 and 0.5 is 0.25. Then velocity at, one, at 0.75, 1.25, 1.75, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. For each of these areas of the rectangle, I'm gonna multiply the height by the width of 0.5. Whew. I got an approximate area of 6.65624. What I've done down here, I've actually uh, calculated the exact answer, it would be 6.6 .6 repeating. Just to show you, again, I don't know if the MRAM is over or under without calculating the exact value. I happen to know that this one's an under now. But comparing the last example of 6.625 to 6.65624, the more sub-intervals you have, the more accurate your answer.
the problem that we have here, when you double the number of subintervals you have, you double the amount of work that you have to do, which kind of sucks sometimes. All right. Uh, another thing that we have down here is they just summed all the velocities and multiplied by 0.5 once since each individual uh, uh, height is being multiplied by 0.5, you can just add them all together and half them at the end. And I promised to tell you guys this, and now here's how you can tell whether an LRAM or an RRAM is an over or under approximation. For the MRAM, the answer is always going to be, I don't know, because you have to find the exact value in order to find out uh, if if it is over or under. Now looking over here for inscribed rectangles, that's an easy one. An inscribed rectangle just means draw every rectangle underneath the curve. So looking here, in, inscribed rectangles will always be under approximations because they are below the curve. Circumscribed means put the rectangles above the curve. Circumscribed rectangles all above the curve will always be over approximations. Now, when we talk about LRAMs or RRAMs, the difference comes when we're talking about increasing functions, increasing, or decreasing functions. Now, let's look at these in two different sets, all right? So, an increasing. On the left-hand side, I'll put LRAM. On the right-hand side, I'll, be, I'll put RRAM. So, LRAM. An increasing function is going to look like this. And our LRAM is going to have all of our rectangles are going to have the left endpoints on the uh, uh, function. So notice how if I use left endpoints and the function is increasing, we have entirely rectangles underneath the curve. So if the function is increasing, and you're using an LRAM, you will have an under approximation. If you are using an RRAM and you have an increasing function, again, all of our rectangles are going to be determined off of the right endpoint. So we would draw much like this. So there's an RRAM uh, on an increasing function. That will be an over approximation. I will tell you that I have viewed many, many AP tests, and this is usually one of the questions on one of the free response questions. They will give you tabular data, have you calculate an, uh, a left endpoint Riemann sum or LRAM, Somewhere in the problem, they say it is solely increasing. And since you are using left endpoints, you have to interpret that that means it is an under approximation. The reverse works when the function is decreasing. If we are using an LRAM on a decreasing function, again, decreasing looks like it go down. LRAM is going to look like this. Left endpoints determining our rectangles. So if the function is decreasing, an LRAM is an under approximation. If the function is decreasing and you're using an RRAM, again decreasing, we're determining off of the right endpoints, so you will have an under approximation. Oh, wait. Did I say that wrong? Ah, oh, man. Okay. So over here, I see the hanging off bits. That will be an oh, okay. That will be an over approximation. I think I was spending too much time looking at my uh, computer, making sure I'm writing everything right, I'm not making sure that I'm writing all the right stuff. So now we can see. If, you are in, if your function is increasing, you use an LRAM under approximation, increasing an RRAM over approximation. Decreasing an LRAM, you have an over approximation. Decreasing an RRAM, you have an under approximation. Again, those will be things you will have to justify on an answer. Uh, yeah, just keep those in mind. Now let's look, ooh, man, 
Now we are going to calculate all three rams for this function. The first thing that I like to do here is I like to graph the function. So if I'm graphing the function, uh, let me see here. Oh, hey, look, I have a graph right here. So you can actually see <clears throat> on my window, if I pull up my calculator, there we go. On the window, I have actually changed my x min and my x max to reflect what, uh, what is occurring in my interval. So I'm going from 0 to 2. Uh, down here, I just adjusted my y min and my y max in order to be able to show everything on the screen. So you'll see here, each of these tick marks at the bottom uh, represents 1. Each of these vertical tick marks represents 1 as well. Uh, basically, what I'm trying to say here is I've got that graph right there. That graph right there is going to allow me to draw a ram in order to uh, uh, get my approximation. Now, what I can see here is I have to have four sub intervals. So for those four sub intervals, that means how many rectangles I'm going to draw. So here, in order to find the width of each sub interval, I'll call that delta x, the change in the x for each rectangle. It's going to be, just to give you a, a quick formula here, you could use b minus a over n. The b being the end of the subinterval, the a being the beginning, and the n being the number. So here in this case, I've got 2 minus 0 over, uh, I think it says 4 subintervals. Yes, it does. 2 minus 0 over 4 gives me 2 fourths or 1 half. So when I go in and draw my rectangles, I'm going to draw those in in red. I want to make sure that each rectangle goes at the half tick mark. So look in here. There's all my rectangle endpoints. In order to determine how high the rectangles go, I look at which type of RAM I'm doing first. The first type of RAM that I'm doing, I'm just going to say, um, let's start with an, um, let's go R RAM for, mm, no, we don't read from right to left, do we? Let's go with an LRAM first, all right? So an LRAM. Since we're talking LRAM, L stands for left. For each sub-interval, starting at 0, going to 0.5, which one's the left endpoint? The 0 is the left endpoint. So I'm going to draw my left side, match up with the curve, draw a horizontal top, and then bring it down like that. Horizontal, bring it down. Uh, horizontal, bring it down. Horizontal, bring it down. So there's a visualization for my L RAM. Now when I look at this, I can actually start calculating my L RAM, noticing that each of my delta x's is 0.5. I can keep track of that in one way, or I can use this chart that I'm about to show you in order to um, up in order to keep things organized. You don't have to use this chart, but I find it to be helpful. Again, sometimes you'll see people doing like what was on those examples where they'll put the height of each rectangle down here and then add them together and multiply by the widths. I don't like doing that. What I like doing on this one is using this chart. And this chart is going to have four rows and then as many columns as we have uh, uh, sub intervals. So the first row, what I write out is all of the sub intervals. And all of those sub intervals, we're going to start at the small end of our uh, uh, evaluation interval and jump up by this amount for each interval. So looking at that, the first sub interval starts at zero, goes up to one half. The second sub interval starts at one half and goes up to one half above one half. Third sub interval starts at one, goes up to three halves. And final sub interval starts at three halves and goes up to the final sub interval. I like doing it this way because now I can see clearly I have one, two, three, four sub intervals. And now I need to find out what the height at each of those sub intervals is here. So to find the height, I'm gonna put down f of x. 
and the f of x. Again, I can see here that I've got my LRAM. So my LRAM, I'm choosing the left endpoint for each of these. Left endpoint is the left number on each subinterval. So here, I'm finding like f of 0, which equals f of 0. That's just going to be 4. Now here's where I'm probably going to need to start using my calculator for this one. So my next one, I want to find f of uh, 0.5 at this point. f of 0.5. Five, ah, three. F of one for the next one. Three again. And the final one is going to be F of three halves, which if I remember correctly, is going to be four again. Three halves, yeah, four again. Now here, I happen to know that I'm going to be um, finding the area of rectangles. So the rectangle is going to be the height by the width, and the width here is going to be my delta x for each subinterval. Now here, I happen to have equal subintervals, so it's pretty easy. One half, one half, one half, one half. I will warn you that subintervals don't always have to be equal. And the last line, I'm going to have my area. And my area is going to be the height times the width. So it's just going to be the, these two rows multiplied together. Four times a half, two. Three times a half, three halves. Uh, three times a half, three halves. Four times a half, two. So the LRAM that we're going to have off of this one, the LRAM is going to be equal to 2 plus 3 halves plus 3 halves plus 2. Uh, it looks like we have a 7 on that one. Now I will warn you, since this function is not solely increasing, nor is it solely decreasing, we don't know if that's an over-approximation or an under-approximation, but we know that our LRAM, the approximation, is approximately 7 square units. All right, so we've gone through the LRAM, but notice that the directions do say to calculate all three RAMs for the uh, 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 function and the intervals listed below. So now instead of the LRAM, I want to do an RRAM. RRAM is going to be the exact same thing, except for now when I construct my rectangles, if I'm drawing the picture, instead of drawing those rectangles uh, from the left endpoints, I'm going to go from the right endpoints. <coughs> so when I draw my rectangles, again, the right endpoint of the first interval is right here. I draw up to the height and go over. There's my first rectangle. Second rectangle. Third rectangle. And fourth rectangle. And again, it looks like my rectangles are kind of leaning over. Oops, my bad, my bad. Now here, when I'm using the table, again, I'm using the exact same table that I have over here, except instead of finding f of 0 for the first one, I know I'm doing r rams, so I look at the right endpoint, f of 1 half. This one, I'm going to have f, oops, why not put the parenthesis there? It's like I forgot how to write function notation all of a sudden. f of 1, f of 3 halves, and f of 2. It seems to me we already calculated many of those, like f of 1 half was 3, f of 1 was 3, f of 3 halves was 4. Again, just plugging those into the function. 3, 3, 4. All that's left for us to do is find f of 2. f of 2 looks like 6 in the case. So now looking a little bit further, our delta x, since we're using the same interval and same number of subintervals, still going to be, oh wait, I didn't use 0.5 before. Let's have consistency here, right? One half, 
one half, one half, one half. Going through, this will be three halves, three halves, two, and three. And my R ram is going to be equal to uh, three halves plus three halves plus two plus three, uh, three, six, eight. Eight is going to be my answer. Now I know some of you might be running into that old uh, uh, bad thing to do where you might see that uh, the LRAM was seven and the RAM was eight. We don't know if one of these is an over approximation, the other one's an under approximation. So don't assume that the answer is between seven and eight. There are some calculations that we have to do to actually find out what the area is there, but we're not quite there yet. We still need to calculate our MRAM, and the MRAM is going to be the exact same setup. Here we're doing an M. RAM. Note that I'm marking down which one I'm doing so that I can remember which one I'm actually concentrating on at any given point. So the MRAM means to determine your height, you go to the middle of the uh, interval. So the middle of the interval is right here. Go up to the height, draw in your rectangle. Middle of the right interval, draw your height, sketch in the rectangle. Middle. Sketch in the rectangle. Middle, sketching your rectangle. I don't like using the picture because it's not very accurate. Instead, I like to go over here and clearly art articulate what's halfway between zero and one half. If you don't know that, whoopsies, certainly not one half. All you have to do to find the midpoint, add these two together and divide by two. So we're gonna find F of a quarter, F of three quarters, F of five quarters, and F of seven quarters. So here, Again, switching over to my calculator, I can find one quarter, ah, heck, let's just go over to the table, one quarter, three quarter, one and a quarter, one and three quarters. So I can get all my values really simply there. 3.375. Uh, just reading them off one quarter, 2.875. Five quarters, 3.375 again. And seven quarters, 4.875. Now here we have our delta x, again, since some same calculations. 0.5 across the board. Because this uh, has equal lengths here, I am going to just add them all together and multiply by 0.5 all at once. You can do that if the sub intervals are equal widths. So my M RAM. Again, it is an approximation, so it's not dead on, but it's going to be that delta x times the quantity of 3.375 plus, I'm gonna make sure that you guys can see that, uh, you can't see it. 3.375 plus 2.875 plus 3.375 plus 4.875, and I'm uh, going to calculate that using the cheat machine. There we go, move it so that we can see, and pull up my calculator, go to the home screen. I know that I am doing 0.5 times the quantity of 
3.375 plus 2.875 plus 3.375 plus <clears throat> 4.875. Make sure I typed them in all right. 7.25. 7.25. 7.25. And there we have calculated for us an LRAM, an RAM, and an M RAM. All of the RAM family is together. And that's that's everything from this from this section. The whole big idea of this section is being able to calculate a RAM. We will do plenty of practice on it tomorrow. Uh, if you want to take a look at an exploration one before tomorrow, feel free. This uh, worksheet is going to be in the folder. Uh, it is going to be a Kuta software uh, worksheet. Here's the uh, book exercises. Number six, there is a typo. You're just supposed to repeat number five, exercise 5B, and we'll call this a day.